I'm going to introduce you to a lady. We had nothing in common. I was a son of an economic migrant father, Jamaican father, an Irish mother. She was, this lady was on my TV when I was at primary school when we used to have three channels. <laughs> Complaining, lobbying, writing. They used to make fun of her and said that she was crazy, that she was getting in the way when we had three channels. Yes, I'm talking about Mary Whitehouse. Upper middle class, conservative. Not necessarily I agreed with the politics, but the message from the 60s was clear. In order for us to go forward, we have to go back. So what I want you to do, and it's going to be painful for some of you, I want you to go back to 1991. 1991. This is a key year for the reality of youth violence in the UK. So here goes. Let's look at 1991 in South Central LA. This film came out. Now, by show of hands, who's seen this film? Okay, about 50%. So let's break it down for those who haven't. On the right here, you have the gentleman known as Ice Cube. So in the film, he's portrayed as a gang member, um, you know, violent lifestyle, etc. To the left, okay, your left, you have Ice Cube's brother in the film, who just receives a scholarship to go university, but he's also a young father. He gets murdered in the film. Anyone who watched that film in 1991 looked at it and thought, what is going on in LA? Because that wasn't our reality here in the UK. I watched the film recently again, and I'm happy to share this with you. I shed a tear because I realized that is part of our reality now here in the UK. Let me prove it to you. By show of hands, tell me if you've played or aware of this game. Everyone, hands up, keep them up high. Look around, people in the room, keep your hands up high if you've played this game. None of you have. Read it again. <laughs> you see, I do these things in the lab at night, like a mad professor. <laughs> I go into primary schools. I do exactly the same test with the children. 7 to 11 years old. Like you, they put their, put their hands up. So I go, who's, who's, what, who's played this game? And they all go, sick! <laughs> That's not a problem for me. So I say, okay, put your hands down. Now put your hands up. Whose parents bought it them? The same amount of hands go up. That's the problem. And what's this game about? Because I guarantee none of you have ever seen the bottom right-hand corner of my arm here, your left, mature 17. Interestingly, the spike in absences from school the day after a new game comes out is also something we need to look at. We need to look at children turning up to school tired. Yeah? Two, three o'clock in the morning playing these games. We need to look at the value base and the moral compass about what's happening. Because what's happening in those games, are those games about global warming and daisy picking? You can kill, you can maim, you can rob. How are these children viewing women from a very young age? Now for the sociologists in the room, you'll enjoy this. So let's take a little view into the chaos theory. To my right, you have a mainstream rapper, multi-million pound selling rapper. And here, my left, your right, you have a rock artist, well-known, mainstream, multi-platinum selling. Let's look at the demographic. So when we look at the demographic of the rock artist, double incomes, two holidays a year, they see the same doctor, they've got a lawn, a gravel drive, the school that they're going, they're told, get 10 A's. Let's look at the predominant demographic of those who listen to that side. Low conductors, communities surrounded by Dixie Chicken, 
betting offices. They're told at the same age, even though they're only five minutes drive from that same other school, just get five A to C's. But outside where they live, what else is happening? Crack, gangs. What does it lead to? Desensitization. So that means that really they're primed. Nothing shakes them anymore. Violence is not a problem anymore. Now here's a question, Birmingham. Why don't we have a, a gang in Birmingham called the Sully Hall Man them? <laughs> Why don't we have a, a gang in Birmingham called the Noel Bangers? <laughs> and we laugh. And I understand why we laugh. I'm one of those fortunate practitioners because I work in the adult estate, youth estate, and the children's estate. The adult estate, when I've engaged in there and I'm working with guys who are on long sentences, at the end of the day, I pack up and I leave. When in the youth offending, I pack up and I leave. I can't do that with the children's estate. Sometimes I leave at five in the morning, I catch a long train, I won't say where to, another long train, because I have to be in the education department for 9 a.m. And then I'll, I'll, I'll look at the, the sheet and I'll look at the background of the young person. He might be in for murder or attempted murder, 13 years old. So you can imagine when I'm about to walk into his space, what I'm thinking we're going to see. And I walk into the room, ladies and gentlemen, and I see a child again. No conflict. No bad parenting, no gangs. I walk in the room and I see that child. And when you work in a secure estate and you see children, children, 12, 13 years old, some of them with 13, 15, 18 year tariffs, when you walk in there and there's, there's tons of messages. So recently I saw them and they'd all, clearly they'd had a, um, a delivery of parcels from their family. So they were all in fresh trainers, Jordans, Harachis. If you don't know what Harachis are, ask the young person next to you. <laughs> no laces. <coughs> Why no laces? To stop them from hanging themselves. It's a place of trauma. So what we see now in terms of violence is the gentrification of it, because somebody has thought, we can make money off this. It's like the N-word. The N-word, the worst word you can call the black community, but the corporate industry took it away, <coughs> repackaged it, and sold it back. Now it's dominant culture. Some might say it's a term of endearment. It's not acceptable. Can you ever imagine the worst name that you can be called based upon your ethnicity in music, in films, in games, in the playground. You can't, but it's happening. So the gentrification means our mainstream movies start to look like this. Now, some might argue that art mimics life, but that's not everybody's reality. Gang violence, gun crime, only accounts for approximately 1% to 1.5% of crime nationally. But here's the interesting thing. When we look at a social return on investment model, one shooting costs you and me, the taxpayer, 1.4 million per shooting. A stabbing costs you and me, the taxpayer, 300,000 pounds per stabbing. And interestingly, in a post-riot era, who were the riots blamed on? the gangs, but it wasn't the gangs. And those who read and study and understand and work in the field know it wasn't the gangs. So the gentrification continues on our screens, weekly, monthly, recommissioned. And here's an interesting one. Veteran, he comes back from the war, he has to get rehoused, he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. He's rehoused on the estate. Guess who he bumps into in the corridor? The man them. 
So you've got this ex-army having a mini war with the local gang on the estate. Look at the imagery. Who's challenging what's coming out through the microphones, through the lenses? Who's challenging? Because ultimately, it's your children, your grandchildren, your niece and your nephews who are absorbing this. There's something ironic that uh, our generation only had three channels. This generation has 300. Scientists say that the average person will live to 65. We could die today. We could die 100. I hate to be real about it. But 65, if you watch TV for four hours a day for the whole of your life, you'd have spent 12 years in front of a screen. That's based upon TV. Interesting. Corporate responsibility. We will queue for days, but we won't phone our nan. <laughs> now, you might say, Ray, for the academics, there's no empirical evidence to suggest that this is... No, you're right. There may not be no empirical evidence, but I've got some anecdotal evidence for you. Almost from the ether, we get this message from the person who created a lot of the technology. And today I've heard a lot about technology and regeneration. And you're right, used correctly, it can liberate. But <coughs> is it liberating? Or is it isolating? How many of you, and I, I, I dare you to do this, next time you sit down as a family to have a meal, or sit down with your partner to have a meal, watch how many times we check our phones. And you're all looking at it, partners are in here looking at each other like, <laughs> I can see you. But that reminds me of this lyric from the Taurus B.I.G. Steve Jobs was saying the same thing. Never get high in your own supply. <laughs> Interesting, it's all connected. And while we're on the subject of B.I.G., we have to look at post-coldism because post-coldism is the driver for a lot of the gang violence. You see, because I don't hold gang violence to be a criminal justice issue per se. I hold it to be a public health issue. Why? Why would two young, young men who've never met each other before, not fallen out over a girl, not fallen out over money, not fallen out of, uh, out of trading drugs, the first time they see each other, one of them pulls out a, a, a weapon, loaded weapon, and blows the other one's brains out over postcodes and there's one part missing. Postcodes in which they both live in social housing. So I'm on the plane from Dallas to San Jose. True story. I've flown London, Dallas. I'm going to Silicon Valley to a conference. I'm in the air. For those of you who've been to America, you know this journey. I'm in the air, and it dawned upon me the vastness of this, that country, the flight, the length of the flight, Historically, you had these two mainstream artists, one who represented the West Coast, the other who represented the East Coast. The distance between them by plane was six hours. Do you know anyone who's going to book a ticket, jump on a plane, go and punch someone in the face and fly back? <laughs> you don't. But do you see the model? take it, lift it, and apply it. But they're not six hours apart. Could be six minutes or six roads away. Parental responsibility. I mentioned to you earlier, I'm a son of an economic migrant Jamaican father. We didn't have anything called the naughty step. I don't know what that was. I wish I did. <laughs> but the point is, you as a parent or grandparent, you've been disempowered by technology. What I want you to do, anyone over 25, 30, I want you to remember what it was like when you got grounded. That bedroom, what it looked like, what it smelt like. You were fortunate if you had your dinner that night. What does grounding look like in 2014? You have to plug out the router, turn off the WhatsApp, <laughs> take off the Snapback, Snapchat, I can't keep up with them. Log off the face, look at the, look what's happened. 
where's the manual that comes with parenting in 2014? How are you going to bypass technology in order that you can establish your parenting skills? A statement of Jesse Jackson. Do you know what I did a month ago? As a person who loves technology, but a month ago what I did, I started picking up conkers. Because for me, not they weren't for me, but the process, we have to start thinking about how we can empower our youth and our children with enough knowledge to use technology correctly, but not get lost in it. And those of you in here know what that means. Some of us, and we have to say this, some of us as adults, as parents, as uncles, as grandparents, we're not present. So we need a counter-narrative. Now, you usually hear this around October, Black History Month, but just by the way, it's, you're allowed to quote African proverbs outside of black history. <laughs> okay. But we know it takes a village to raise a child, but what if there's no village? and mom's a single parent, and she's holding down two jobs, and she's in a one-bedroom flat with her son in the middle of that estate. Two African proverbs in a row. But this is the one, this is the ultimate one. It's all over my social media arm. It's, what, it's my mantra. If young people aren't initiated into village, they will burn it down to feel its warmth. Am I lying? Not that long ago. And finally, the good news is that not every young person's involved. The good news is that there's people out there who will punch through. <coughs> there's people out there who will go to some of the schools that are underachieving, but they will achieve. But let's not make youth violence the dominant culture. Everyone has a role to play. Thank you. <laughs>